Treacheries of the Space Marines The Carrion Anthem by David Annandale He was thinking bitter thoughts about glory. He couldn't help it. As he took his seat in the governor's private box overlooking the stage, Corvus Parthaman was surrounded by glory that was not his. The luxury of the box, a riot of crimson leather and velvet laced with gold and platinum thread, was a tribute, in the form of excess, to the honour of Governor Elpidius. That didn't trouble Corvus. The box represented a soft, false glory, a renown that came with the title, not the deeds or the man. Then there was the stage, to which all sightlines led. It was a prone monolith, carved from a single massive obsidian slab. It was an altar, on which one could sacrifice gods, but instead it abased itself beneath the feet of the artist. It was stone magnificence, and tonight it paid tribute to Corvus's brother. That didn't trouble Corvus either. He didn't understand what Gurgis did, but he recognised that his twin did, at least, work for his laurels. Art was a form of deed, Corvus supposed. What bothered him were the walls, windowless, rising two hundred metres to meet in the distant vault of the ceiling. They were draped with immense tapestries. These were hand-woven tributes to imperial victories. Kylder, the plainest steps, Icar Six, on and on and on. Warriors of legend, both ancient and contemporary, towered above Corvus. They were meant to inspire, to draw the eye as the spirit soared, moved by the majesty of the tribute paid by the music. The works of art in this monumental space, stone, image and sound, were supposed to entwine, to further the glory of the Emperor and his legions. But lately, the current worship had reversed. Now the tapestry colossi, frozen in their moments of triumphant battle, were also bowing down before the glory of Gurgis. And that was wrong. That was what made Corvus dig his fingers in hard, enough to mar the lever of his armrests. The governor's wife, Lady Ahala, turned to him, her multiple necklaces rattling together. "'It's nice to see you, Colonel,' she said. "'You must be so proud.' Proud of what, he wanted to say. Proud of his homeworld's contribution to the Imperial Crusades? That was a joke. Ligator was a joke. Of the hundred tapestries here in the performance hall of the Imperial Palace of Culture, not one portrayed a legation hero. Deep in the Segmentum Pacificus, far from the front lines of any contest, Ligator was untouched by war beyond the usual tithe of citizens bequeathed to the Imperial Guard. Many of its sons had fought and fallen on distant soil, but how many had distinguished themselves to the point that they may be remembered and celebrated? None. Proud of what? Of his own war effort? That he commanded Ligata's defence regiment? That only made him part of the legation joke. Officers who were posted back to their homeworlds developed reputations, especially when those homeworlds were pampered, decadent backwaters. The awful thing was that he couldn't even ask himself what he'd done wrong. He knew the answer. Nothing. He had done everything right. He had made all the right friends, served under all the right officers, bowed and scraped in all the right places at all the right times. He had done his duty on the battlefield too. No one could say otherwise. But there had been no desperate charges. No last man standing defences. The Ligaton regiments were called upon to maintain supply lines, garrison captured territory, and mop up the token resistance of those who were defeated, but hadn't quite come to terms with the fact. They were not summoned when the need was urgent. The injustice made him seethe. He knew his worth, and that of his fellows. They fought and died with the best, when given the chance. Not every mop-up had been routine. Not every territory had been easily pacified. Ligatons knew how to fight, and they had plenty to prove. Only, no one ever saw. No one thought to look, because everyone knew Ligator's reputation. It was the planet of the Dilantant, and the artist. The planet of the song. Proud of that? 
Yes, that was exactly what Erhala meant. Proud of the music, proud of the song, proud of Gurgis. Ligata's civilian population rejoiced in the planet's reputation. They saw no shame or weakness in it. They used the same logic as Corvus's superiors, who thought they had rewarded his political loyalty by sending him home. Who wouldn't want a pleasant command, far from the filth of a chaos-infested hive world? Who wouldn't want to be near Gurgis Parthaman, maker not of song, but of the song? Yes, Corvus thought, Gurgis had done a good thing there. Over a decade ago now, the song was a hymn to the glory of the Emperor. Hardly unusual, but Regent Imperator was rare. It was the product of the special alchemy that, every so often, fused formal magnificence with populist appeal. The tune was magisterial, enough to be blasted from a titan's combat horn, simple enough to be whistled by the lowliest trooper, and catchy enough that, once heard, it was never forgotten. It kept up morale on a thousand besieged worlds, and fired up the valour of millions of troops charging to the rescue. Corvus had every right, every duty, to be proud of his brother's accomplishment. It was a work of genius. So he'd been told. He would have to be satisfied with the word of others. Corvus had Amusia. He was as deaf to music as Gurgis was attuned to it. His twin's work left him cold. He heard a clearer melody line in the squealing of a greenskin pinned beneath a dreadnought's foot. To Lady Ahala, Corvus said, I couldn't be more proud. Do you know what he's offering us tonight? Elpidius asked. He settled his soft bulk more comfortably. I don't. Really? Ahala sounded surprised. But you're his twin. We haven't seen each other for the best part of a year. Elpidius frowned. I didn't think you'd been away. Corvus fought back a humiliated wince. Gurgis was the one off planet, he said, searching the stars for inspiration or some other pampered nonsense. Corvus didn't know and didn't care. Hanging from the vault of the hall were hundreds of glow globes, patterned into a celestial map of the Imperium. Now they faded, silencing the white noise of tens of thousands of conversations. Darkness embraced the audience, and only the stage was illuminated. From the wings came the choir. The singers wore black uniforms, as razor-creased as any officer's ceremonial garb. They marched in in their hundreds, until they filled the back half of the stage. They faced the audience. At first, Corvus thought they were wearing silver helmets, but then they reached up and pulled down the masks. Featureless, eyeless, the masks covered the top half of each man's face. How are they going to see him conduct? Alpidius wondered. Ahala giggled with excitement. That's nothing, she whispered. She placed a confiding hand on Corvus's arm. I've heard that there haven't been any rehearsals. Not even the choir knows what is going to be performed. Corvus blinked. What? Isn't it exciting? She turned back to the stage, happy and placid before the prospect of the impossible. The light continued to fade until there was only a narrow beam front and centre, a bare pinprick on the frozen night of stone. The silence was as thick and heavy as the stage. It was broken by the solemn, slow clop of boot heels. His pace, steady as a ritual, as if he were awed by his own arrival. Gurgis Parthaman, Emperor's bard and Ligata's favourite son, walked into the light. He wore the same black uniform as the musicians, but no mask. Instead... "'What's wrong with his face?' Ahala asked. Corvus leaned forwards. Something cold scuttled through his gut. His twin's face was his own. The same severe planes, narrow chin and grey eyes, even the same cropped black hair. But now Corvus stared at a warped mirror. Gurgis was wearing an appliance that flashed like gold, but even from this distance displayed the unforgiving angles and rigidity of adamantium. It circled his head, 
like a laurel wreath. At his face, it extended needle-thin claws that pierced his eyelids, pinning them open. Gurgis gazed at his audience with a manic, implacable stare that was equal parts absolute knowledge and terminal fanaticism. His eyes were as much prisoners as those of his choir, but where the singer saw nothing, he saw too much and reveled in the punishment. His smile was a peeling back of lips. His skin was too thin, his skull too close to the surface. When he spoke, Corvus heard the hollow sound of wind over rusted pipes. Insects rustled at the frayed corners of reality. Fellow legations, Gurgis began. Before we begin, it would be positively heretical of me not to say something about the role of the patron of the arts. The life of a musician is a difficult one, because we do not produce a tangible product. There are many who regard us as superfluous, a pointless luxury the Imperium could happily do without. This fact makes those who value us even more important. Patrons are the blessed few who know the artist really can make a difference. He paused for a moment. If he was expecting applause, he did not receive it. The knowledge and ice in his rigid gaze stilled the audience. Unperturbed, he carried on. I have, over the course of my musical life, been privileged to have worked with more than my share of generous, committed, sensitive patrons. It is thanks to them that my music has been heard at all. He lowered his head, as if overcome by modesty. Corvus would have snorted at the conceit of the gesture, but he was too tense. He dreaded the words that might come from his brother's rictus face. Gurgis looked up, and now his eyes seemed to glow with a light the colour of dust and ash. Yes, he said, the generous patron is to be cherished, but even more precious, even more miraculous, even more worthy of celebration is the patron who inspires, the patron who opens the door to new vistas of creation and pushes the artist through. I stand before you as the servant of one such patron. I know that my humble tribute to the Emperor is held in high regard, but I can now see what a poor counterfeit of the truth that effort is. Tonight, so will you. I cannot tell you what my patron has unveiled for me, but I can show you. The composer's last words slivered out over the hall like a death rattle. Gurgis turned to face the choir. He raised his arms. The singers remained unmoving. The last light went out. A terrible, far too late certainty hit Corvus. He must stop this. Then, Gurgis began to sing. For almost a minute, Corvus felt relief. No demon burst from his brother's mouth. His pulse slowed. He had fallen for the theatrics of a first-rate showman. That was all. The song didn't sound any different to him than any other of Gurgis's efforts. It was another succession of notes, each as meaningless as the next. Then, he noticed what was wrong. He wasn't hearing a simple succession. Even his thick ears could tell that Gurgis was singing two notes at once, then three, then four. The song became impossible. Somehow, still singing, Gurgis drew a breath and though Corvus heard no real change in the music, the breath seemed to mark the end of the refrain. It also marked the end of peace, because now the choir began to sing. To a man, they joined in. Melding with Gurgis's voice, the song became a roar. The darkness began to withdraw as a glow spread across the stage. It seeped from the singers. It poured like radiation fog into the seating. It was a colour that made Corvus wince. It was a kind of green, if green could scream. It pulsed like taut flesh. It grinned like chaos. Corvus leapt to his feet. So did the rest of the audience. For a crazy moment of hope, he thought of ordering the assembled people to fall upon the singers and silence them. 
but they weren't rising, like him, in alarm. They were at one with the music, and they joined their voices to its glory, and their souls to its power. The roar became a wave. The glow filled the hall, and it showed Corvus nothing he wanted to see. Beside him, the governor and his wife stood motionless, their faces contorted with ecstasy. They sang as if the song were their birthright. They sang to bring down the sky. Their heads were thrown back, their joys as wide as a snake's, and their throats twitched and spasmed with the effort to produce inhuman chords. Corvus grabbed Ilpidius by the shoulders and tried to shake him. The governor's frame was rigid and grounded to the core of Ligata. Corvus might have been wrestling with a pillar, but the man wasn't cold like a stone. He was burning up. His eyes were glassy. Corvus checked his pulse. Its rhythm was violent, rapid, irregular. Corvus yanked his hands away. They felt slick with disease. Something that lived in the song, scraped at his mind like fingernails on plastic, but couldn't find purchase. He opened the flap of his shoulder holster and pulled out his last pistol. He leaned over the railings of the box and sighted on his brother's head. He felt no hesitation. He felt only necessity. He pulled the trigger. Gurgis fell. The top of his skull seared away. The song didn't care. It roared on, its joy unabated. Corvus fired six more times, each shot dropping a member of the choir. Finally, he stopped. The song wasn't a spell, and it wasn't a mechanism. It was a plague, and killing individual vectors was worse than useless. It stole precious time from action that might make a difference. He ran from the box. In the vestibule, the ushers were now part of the choir, and the song pursued Corvus as he clattered down the marble steps to the mezzanine and thence to the ground floor. The foyer, as cavernous as the performance hall, led to the great gallery of art. Its vaulted length stretched a full kilometre to the exit of the palace. Floor-to-ceiling glass aches of the Primarchs gazed down on heroic bronzes. Warriors, beyond counting, trampled the Imperium's enemies, smashing them into fragmented agony that sank into the pedestals. But the gallery was no longer a celebration of art and glory. It was a throat, and it held the song after him. Though Melody was a stranger to him, still he could feel the force of the music, interchangeable yet pushing him with the violence of a hurricane's breath. The light was at his heels, flooding the throat with its mocking bile. He burst from the grand doorway and onto the plaza. He stumbled to a halt, horrified. The concert had been broadcast. Palestrina, Legita's capital, and a city of thirty million, screamed. It convulsed. The late evening glow of the city was stained with the chaos non-light. In the plaza, in the streets, in the windows of Pelestrina's delicate and coruscating towers, the people stood and sang their demise. The roads had become a nightmare of twisted flaming wreckage as drivers, possessed by art, slammed into each other. Victims of collisions not quite dead sang instead of screaming their last. Everywhere the choir chanted to the sky and the sky answered with flame and thunder. To the west, between the towers, the horizon strobed and rumbled as fireballs bloomed. He was looking at the spaceport, Corvus realised, and seeing the destruction caused by every landing and departing ship, suddenly losing all guidance. There was a deafening roar overhead, and a cargo transport came in low and mad, its engines burning blue. It ploughed into the side of a tower a few blocks away. The ship exploded filling the sky with the light and sound of its death. Corvus ducked as pieces of shrapnel the size of meteors arced down, gouging impact craters into street and stone and flesh. The tower collapsed with lazy majesty, falling against its neighbours and spreading a domino celebration of destruction. Dust billowed up in a choking racing cloud. It rushed over Corvus, hiding the sight of the dying city. But the chant went on. He coughed, gagging as grit filled his throat and lungs. He staggered, but started moving again. Though visibility was down to a few metres, and his eyes watered and stung, he felt that he could see clearly again. It was as if, by veiling the death of the city from his gaze, the dust had broken a spell. Palestrina was lost, 
but that didn't absolve him of his duty to the Emperor. Only his own death could do that. As long as he drew breath, his duty was to fight for Legata, and save what he could. He had to find somewhere the song had not reached, find men who had not heard and been infected by the plague. Then he could mount a defence, perhaps even a counter-attack, even if that were nothing more than a scorched earth purge. There would be glory in that. But first, a chance to regroup. First, a sanctuary. He hoped that he knew where to go. He felt his way through the grey limbo of the plaza, a hand over his mouth, trying not to cough up his lungs. It took him the best part of an hour to reach the far side of the Palace of Culture. By that time, the worst of the dust had settled, and the building's intervening bulk further screened him. He could breathe again. His movements picked up speed and purpose. He needed a vehicle, one he could manoeuvre through the tangled chaos of the streets. Half a kilometre down from the plaza, he found what he wanted. A civilian was straddling his idling bike. He had been caught by the song just before pulling away. Corvus tried to push him off, but he was as rigid and locked down as the governor had been. Corvus shot him. As he hauled the corpse away from the bike, he told himself that the man had already been dead. If Corvus hadn't granted him mercy, something else would have. A spreading fire, falling debris. If nothing violent had happened, then... Corvus stared at the singing pedestrians, and thought for the implications of what he was seeing. Nothing, he was sure, could free the victims once the song took hold. So they would stand where they were struck and sing and do nothing else. They wouldn't sleep. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't drink. Corvus saw the end result, and he also saw the first glimmer of salvation. With a renewed sense of mission, he climbed on the bike and drove off. It was an hour from dawn by the time he left the city behind. Beyond the hills of Palestrina, he picked up even more speed as he hit the parched mudflats. Once fertile, the land here had had its water table drained by the city's thirst. At the horizon, the shadow of the Goric Mesa blocked the stars. At the base of its bulk, he saw pinpricks of light. Those glimmers were his destination and his hope. The ground rose again as he reached the base. He approached the main gate and he heard no singing. Before him, the wall was an adamantium shield, fifty metres high, a sloping, plated curtain of strength. A great aquila was engraved every ten metres along the wall's two-kilometre length. Beyond the wall, he heard the growl of Prometheum engines, the report of firing ranges, the march of boots, the sounds of discipline, discipline that was visible from the moment he arrived. If the sentries were surprised to see him, Dusty and exhausted, arriving on a civilian vehicle instead of in his staff transport, they showed no sign. They saluted, sharp as machines, and opened the gate for him. He passed through into Fort Gorek and the promise of salvation. On the other side of the wall was a zone free of art and music. A weight lifted from Corvus's shoulders as he watched the pistoning, drubbing rhythm of the military muscle. Strength perfected, and yet, by the throne... It had been almost lost too. A request had come the day before from Jeronim Tarrant, the base's captain, given a momentous, planet-wide event that was a new composition by Gurgis Pathaman. Would the colonel authorise a break in the drills, long enough for the men to sit down and listen to the voxcast of the concert? Corvus had not just rejected the request out of hand, he had forbidden any form of reception and transmission of the performance, he wanted soldiers, he had informed Jeronim. If he wanted Delantance, he would find plenty in the boxes of the Palace of Culture. On his way to the concert, he had wondered about his motives in issuing that order. Jealousy? Was he really that petty? He knew now that he wasn't, and that he'd been right. The purpose of a base such as this was to keep the guard in a state of perpetual instant readiness, because peace might become war in the passing of a second, as it had now. He crossed the parade field, making for the squat command tower at the rear of the base, where it nestled against the basalt wall of the Mesa. He had barely dismounted the bike when Joronim came pounding out of the tower. He was pale, borderline frantic, but remembered to salute. Discipline, Corvus fought. It had saved them so far, it would see them through to victory. Sir! Jeronim said. Do you know what's going on? Are we under attack? We can't get through to anyone. Yes, 
We are at war, Corvus answered. He strode briskly to the door. No one in this base has been in contact with anyone outside for the last ten hours. Joranim shook his head. No, sir. Nothing that makes sense. Anyone transmitting is just sending what sounds like music. Corvus cut him off. You listened? Only a couple of seconds. When we found the nonsense everywhere, we shut down the sound. No one was sending anything coherent. Not even the scythe of judgment. So, the Legaton flagship had fallen. He wasn't surprised, but Corvus discovered that he could still feel dismay. The fact that the base had survived the transmissions told him something. The infection didn't take hold right away. He remembered that the choir and the audience hadn't responded until Gurgis had completed a full refrain. The song's message had to be complete, it seemed, before he could sink in. What actions have you taken? he asked Jeronim, as they headed up the staircase to the command centre. We've been sending out requests for acknowledgements on all frequencies. I've placed the base on heightened alert, and since we haven't been hearing from anyone, I sent out a distress call. Fine, Corvus said. For whatever good that call will do, he thought. By the time the message was received and aid arrived, weeks or months could have elapsed. By that time, the battle for the soul of Legata would have been won or lost. The singers would have starved to death, and either there would be someone left to pick up the pieces, or there wouldn't be. The communications officer looked up from the specs as Corvus and Jeronim walked into the centre. Colonel, he saluted. A capital ship has just transitioned into our system. Really? That was fast. Improbably fast. It's ailing us, the master vox operator announced. Corvus lunged across the room and yanked the headphones from the operator's skull. All messages to be received as text only, until further notice, he ordered. No exceptions, am I clear? The operator nodded. Acknowledge them, Corvus went on. Request identification. The soldier did so. Corvus moved to the plastic window and looked out over the base while he waited. There were five thousand men here. The position was elevated, easily defensible. He had the tools. He just had to work out how to fight. Message received, Colonel. Corvus turned to the Vox operator. His voice sounded all wrong, like that of a man who had suddenly been confronted with the futility of his existence. He was staring at the data slate before him. His face was grey. Read it, Corvus said, and braced himself. Greetings, Imperials. This is the Terminus Est. Typhus entered the strategium as the ship emerged into the real space of the Legatan system. Multiple contacts, Lord, the bridge attendant reported. Of course there were. The Imperium would hardly leave Legatan without a defending fleet. Typhus moved his bulk towards the main oculus. They were already close enough to see the swarm of Imperial cruisers and defence satellites. How many are on attack trajectories? Typhus asked. He knew the answer, but he wanted the satisfaction of hearing it. The officer looked twice at his hololithic display, as if he doubted the reports he was receiving. None, he said after a moment. And how many are targeting us? Another brief silence. None. Typhus rumbled and buzzed his pleasure. The insects that were his parasites and his identity fluttered and scrabbled with excitement. His armour rippled with their movement. He allowed himself a moment to revel in the experience, in the glorious and terrible paradox of his existence. Disease was an endless source of awe in its marriage of death and unrestrained life. It was his delight to spread the gospel of this paradox, the lesson of decay. Before him, the oculus showed how well the lesson was being learned. Bring us closer, he commanded. As once, Lord, the bridge attendant was obedient, but he was a slow learner himself. He was still thinking in terms of a normal combat situation, never mind that the Imperial fleet's lack of response to the appearance of a Chaos capital ship was far from normal. We are acquiring targets, he reported. No need, no need, Typhus said. See for yourselves, all of you. His officers looked up, and Typhus had an audience for the spectacle he had arranged. 
as the Terminus Est closed in on the glowing green and brown globe of Legata, the enemy ships gathered size and definition. Their distress became clear too. Some were drifting, nothing more than adamantium tombs. Others had their engines running, but there was no order to their movements. The ships, Typhus knew, were performing the last commands their crews had given them, and there would be no others to come. Hail! The Imperials, he ordered. Open all frequencies. The stratagem was bathed in the music of disease. Across multiple channels came the same noise, a unified chaos of millions upon millions of throats singing in a single choir. The melody was a simple, sustained, multi-note chord of doom. It became the accompaniment to the view outside the Terminus Est. And now, the movement of the fleet was the slow ballet of entropy and death. Typhus watched two cruisers follow their unalterable routes until they collided. One exploded, its fireball the expanding bloom of a poisonous flower. The other plunged towards Legata's atmosphere, bringing with it the terrible gift of its weapons payload and shattered reactor. Typhus fought about its landfall, and his insects writhed in anticipation. He also thought about the simplicity of the lesson, how pure it was, and how devastating its purity made it. Did the happenstance that had brought Gurgis Parthaman into his grasp taint that purity? Or was that flotsam of luck an essential piece of the composition's beauty? The composer, on a self-indulgent voyage, getting caught in a localised warp storm, winding up in a near collision with the Terminus Est, how could those elements be anything than absolute contingency? His triumph could so easily have never even been an idea. Then again, that man, his ambition that made him so easily corruptible, the confluence of events that granted Typhus this perfect inspiration. They were so improbable. They could not possibly be chance. They had been threaded together by destiny. Flies howled through the stratagem as Typhus tasted the paradox and found it to his liking. Chaos and fate, one and the same. Perhaps Gurgis had thought so too. He had put up no resistance to being infected with the new plague. Typhus was particularly proud of it. The parasitic warp worm laid its eggs in the bloodstream and attacked the brain. It spread itself from mind to mind by the transmission of its idea, and the idea travelled on a sound, a special sound, a song that was an incarnation that thinned the walls between reality and the immaterium, and taught itself to all who had ears to hear. "'My lord, we are being hailed,' said the attendant. Typhus laughed, delighted, and the boils on the deck quivered in sympathy. "'Send them our greetings,' he ordered. Now he had an enemy. Now he could fight. Corvus rejected despair. He rejected the odds. There was an enemy, and duty demanded combat. There was nothing else. Corvus stood at the reviewing stand on the parade grounds, and, speakers turning his voice into Fort Gorak's voice, he addressed the assembled thousands. He explained the situation. He described the plague and its means of contagion. Then he laid down the rules. One was paramount. Music, he thundered, is a disease. It will destroy us if it finds the smallest chink in our armour. We must be free of it and guard against it. Anyone who so much as whistles will be executed on the spot. He felt enormous satisfaction as he gave that order. He didn't worry about why. Less than a day after his arrival, Typhus witnessed the apotheosis of his art. The entire planet was one voice. The anthem, the pestilence, the anthem that was pestilence, had become the sum total of existence on Legata. Its population lived for a single purpose. The purity was electrifying. Or it would have been. But for one single flaw. There was that redoubt. He had thought it would succumb by itself, but it hadn't. It was still sending out desperate pleas to whatever Imperials might hear. Though Typhus could amuse himself with the thought that this one pustule of order confirmed the beauty of corruption, he also knew the truth. 
Over the course of the next few days, the song would begin a ragged demionado as its singers died. If he didn't act, his symphony would be incomplete, spoiled by one false note. It was time to act. The attack came on the evening of the second day. Corvus was walking the parapet when he saw the sky darken. A deep, unending thunder began, and the clouds birthed a terrible rain. The drop pods came first, plummeting with the finality of black judgment. They made landfall on the level ground a couple of kilometres from the base. They left streaks in the air, black, vertical contrails that didn't dissipate. Instead, they grew wider, broke up into fragments and began to whirl. Corvus ran to the nearest guard tower, grabbed a marksman's sniper rifle and peered through its telescopic sight. He could see the movement in the writhing clouds more clearly. It looked like insects. Faintly, impossibly, weaving in and out of the thunder of the pods and the landing craft that now followed on, Corvus heard an insidious buzz. The darkness flowed from the sky. It was the black of absence and grief, of putrefaction and despair, and the unnameable desire. Its touch infected the air of the landing zone, then rippled out towards the base. It was a different disease, one Corvus had no possible defence against. Though no tendril of the blackness itself reached this far, Corvus felt something arrive over the war. The quality of the evening light changed. It turned brittle and sour. He sensed something vital becoming too thin, something wrong start to smile. All around him, Fort Gorak's warning klaxon sounded the call to arms. The din was enormous, and he was surprised and disturbed that he could hear the buzzing of the chaos swarm at all. That told him how sick the real world was becoming, and how hard he would have to fight for it. The drop pods opened, their venomous petals falling back to disgorge the monsters within. Corvus had never felt comfortable around space marines. His legation inferiority complex made exponentially worse by their superhuman power and perfection. But he would have given anything to have one beside him now, as he saw the nightmare visions of them mustering in the near distance. Their armour had long since ceased to be simple ceramite. It was darkness that was iron. An iron that was disease. They assembled into rows and then stood motionless, weapons at the ready. Only they weren't entirely still. Their outlines writhed. Landing craft poured out, corrupted infantry in ever greater numbers. At length, the sky spat out a leviathan that looked to Corvus like a Goliath-class transport. Only so distorted, it seemed more like a terrible wail. Its hull was covered with symbols that tore at Corvus's eyes with obscenities. Around it, coiled things that might have been tendrils or tentacles, its loading bay open like a moor and it vomited hordes of troops and vehicles onto the blackened soil of Legata. The legions of plague gathered before Corvus, and he knew there was no hope of fighting them. But still he would, down to the last man. Though there might be no chance of survival, there would, he now realised with a stir of joy, be the hope of glory in a heroic last stand. Night fell, and the forces of the Terminus Est grew in number and strength. The host was now far larger than was needed to storm Fort Gorek, walls or no, commanding heights or no. But the dark soldiers didn't attack. They stood, massed, and in the open. Once disembarked, they did nothing. Heavy artillery rumbled out of the transports and then stopped, barrels aimed at the sky, full of fret, but silent. The rumble of arrivals stopped. A clammy quiet covered the land. Corvus had returned to the command centre. He could watch just as well from there, and the low buzzing was less noticeable on this side of the plastic. What are they waiting for? Jeronim muttered. The quiet was broken by the distant roar of engines. Corvus raised a pair of magnoculars. Three rhinos were moving to the fore. There were rows of rectangular shapes on the top of the rhinos. They were horned metal, moulded into the shape of screaming demons. Loud speakers, Corvus realised. Dirge casters. If the rhinos broadcast their song, Fort Garrick would fall without a shot being fired. 
Corvus slammed a fist against the alarm trigger. The klaxons whooped over the base. Do not turn these off until I give the order, he told the officers. Still, not loud enough, he thought. He turned to the master Vox. He shoved the operator aside and flipped the switches for the public address system. He grabbed the mic and ran over to the speaker above the doorway to the command center. He jammed the mic into the speaker. Feedback pierced his skull, mauled his hearing and sought to obliterate all thought. He gasped from the pain and staggered under the weight of the sound. The men around him were covering their ears and waving around as if drunk. Covers struggled against the blast of the sound and shook the officers. Now! he screamed. We attack now! Launch the chimeras and take out those vehicles! He would have given his soul for a battery of battle cannons, so he could take out the rhinos from within the safety of the noise shield he had just erected. But this would have to do. He didn't think about how little he might gain in destroying a few speakers. He saw the chance to fight the opponent. He saw the chance for glory. He took charge of the squads that followed behind the Chimeras. He saw the pain of the men's faces as the eternal feedback wore at them. He saw the effort it took them to focus on the simple task of readying their weapons. He understood and hoped that they understood the necessity of his actions and saw the heroism of their struggle for the Emperor. Gurgis had been a fool, Corvus thought. What he did now was worthy of song. The gates opened and the Chimera surged forwards. The rhinos had stopped halfway between their own forces and the wall, easily within the broadcast range of the dirge casters. The song was inaudible. Corvus felt his lips pull back in a snarl of triumph as he held his last pistol and chainsword high and led the charge. The courage of the Imperium burst from the confines of the wall. Corvus yelled as he pounded behind the clanking, roaring chimeras. The feedback whine faded as they left the base behind, but the vehicles had their own din, and Corvus still could hear no trace of the song. Then something spoke with the voice of ending. The sound was enormous, a deep, compound thunder. It was the Chaos Artillery, all guns opening up simultaneously, firing a single monumental barrage. The lower slope of Fort Garak rise exploded, earth geysering skywards. A giant made of noise and air picked Corvus up and threw him. The world tumbled end over end, a hurricane of dirt and rocks and fire. He slammed into the ground and writhed, a pinned insect, as his flattened lungs fought to pull in a breath. When the air came, it was claws and gravel in his chest. His head rang like a struck bell. When his eyes and ears cleared, he saw the wreckage of the chimeras and the rout of his charge. The vehicles had taken the worst of the hits and were shattered smoking ruins of twisted metal. Pieces of men were scattered over the slope, an arm still clutching a lasgun, a torso that ended at the lower jaw. Organs without bodies, bodies without organs. But there were survivors, and as the enemy's guns fell silent, the song washed over the field. Men picked themselves up and froze as the refrain caught them. A minute after the barrage, Corvus was the only man left with a will of his own. He picked up his weapons and stumbled back up the slope towards the wall. As he ran, he thought he could hear laughter sliver through the ranks of the Chaos forces. The gates opened just enough to let him back inside. The feedback blotted out the song, but wrapped itself around his brain like razor wire. He had lost his cap, and his uniform was in tatters. Still, he straightened his posture as he walked back through the stunned troops. Halfway across the grounds, a conscript confronted him. The man's eyes were watering from the hours of mind-destroying feedback, and his nose was bleeding. Let us go, he pleaded. Let us fight. We'll resist as long as we can. Corvus pushed him back. Are you mad? He shouted over the wine. Do you know what would happen to you? The trooper nodded. I was on the wall. I saw. Well then. They look happy when they sing. At least that death isn't pointless torture. Corvus raised his pistol and shot the man through the eye. He turned in a full circle, glaring at his witnesses, making sure they understood the lesson. Then he stalked back to the command centre. A night and a day of the endless electronic wail. Then another night of watching with nerves scraped roar. Corvus 
plugged his ears with cloth, but the feedback stabbed its way through the pathetic barrier. His jaw worked, his cheek muscles twitched, and he saw the same strain in the torque clenched faces of his men. The rhinos came no closer, and there were no other enemy troop movements. Fort Gorak was besieged by absolute stillness, and that would be enough. The third day of the siege was a hell of sleeplessness and claustrophobic rage. Five guardsmen attempted to desert. Corvus had them flogged, then shot. As the sun set, Corvus could see the end coming. There would be no holding out. The shield he had erected was torture, and the madness would tear the base apart. The only thing left was the final, glorious charge that would deny the enemy the kind of triumph that they clearly desired. But how to make that attack if the troops would succumb to the anthem before they even reached the front lines? Corvus covered his ears with his hands, trying to block the wine, to dampen it just enough so that he could think. Silence would have been the greatest gift the Emperor could bestow upon him. Instead, he was granted the next greatest. Inspiration. The Medicia Centre was on the ground floor of the command block. Corvus found the medic and explained what was required. The man blanched and refused. Corvus ordered him to do as he said. Still, the medic protested. Corvus put his pistol to the man's head, and that was convincing enough. Just. The process took all night. At least, for the most part. The men didn't resist being rendered deaf. Some seemed almost relieved to be free of the feedback whine. Most submitted to the procedure with slack faces and dead looks. They had become creatures of stoic despair, held together and animated by their habits of discipline. Corvus watched yet another patient, blood pouring from his ears, contort on a gurney. At least, he thought, he was giving the soldiers back their pride for the end game. There wasn't time to inoculate the entire base contingent against the Anthem, so Corvus settled on the best, most experienced squads. That would be enough. They were her Imperial Guard, and they would give the traitor forces something to think about. Morning came quickly, and though one more enemy gunship had landed during the night, the enemy's disposition otherwise remained unchanged. His eyes rough as sand from sleeplessness. Corvus inspected his assembled force. The soldiers looked like the walking dead, unworthy of the glory they were about to find. He would give it to them anyway, Corvus thought, and they could thank him in the Emperor's light. He glanced at the rest of the troops. He would be abandoning them to their fate. He shrugged. They were doomed regardless, and at least he had enforced loyalty up to the last. He could go to his grave knowing that he had permitted no defection to chaos. He had done his duty. He had earned his glory. Open the gates, he roared, and wished he could hear the strength of his shout over the shriek of the feedback. The sentries couldn't hear him either, but his gesture was clear, and the wall of Fort Gorak opened for the last time. There are songs that have been written about the final charge of Colonel Corvus Parthaman, but they are not sung in the mess halls of the Imperial Guard, and they are not stirring battle hymns. They are mocking obscene doggerel, and they are snarled rather than sung with venomous humour in the corridors of dark ships that ply the wharf like sharks. A few men of the Imperium do hear it in their terminal moments, as their positions are overrun by the hordes of chaos. They do not appreciate it any more than Corvus would have. The charge was a rout. The men ran into lasfire and bolter shells. They were blown to pieces by cannon barrage. They were shredded by chainswords and pulped by armoured fists. Still, they made it further down the hill than even Corvus could have hoped. A coherent force actually hit the chaos front line and did some damage before being annihilated. Their actions might have seemed like glorious heroism, born of nothing to lose desperation. But the fact that not a single man took cover, and that no one did anything but run straight ahead, weapon firing indiscriminately, revealed the truth. They were running to their deaths, and were glad of the relief. Corvus was the last. It took him a moment to notice that he was alone. What with the joy of battle and the ecstasy of being free of the wine. He was still running forwards, running to his glory. 
but he wondered now why there didn't seem to be any shots aimed at him, or why the squad of Chaos Space Marines ahead parted to let him pass. He faltered, and then he saw who was waiting for him. The monster was huge, clad in what had once been Terminator armour, but was now a buzzing, festering exoskeleton. Flies swarmed from the funnels above his shoulders and the lesions in the corrupted ceramite. His single-horned helmet transformed the being's final human traces into the purely demonic. His grip on his giant scythe was relaxed. Corvus saw just how powerful disease-made flesh could be. He charged anyway, draining his last pistol, then pulling his chainsaw. He swung at the Herald of Nurgle. Typhus whipped the man-reaper around. The movement was as rapid as it was casual and contemptuous. He hit Corvus with the shaft and shattered his hip. Corvus collapsed in the dirt. He bit down on his scream as Typhus loomed over him. Kill me, Corvus spat. But know that I fought you to the end. I have my own victory. Typhus made a sound that was the rumble of giant hives. Corvus realised he had just heard laughter. Kill you, Typhus asked. His voice was deep. It was smooth as a deliquescent corpse. I haven't come to kill you. I've come to teach you my anthem. Through his pain, Corvus managed his own laugh. I will never sing it. Really? But you have already. You believe you serve order and light, but like your carrion emperor, everything you do blasts hope and rushes towards entropy. Look what you did to your men. You have served me well, my son. You and your brother both. Corvus fought against the epiphany, but it burst over his consciousness with sickly green light. The truth took him and infected him. He saw his actions, he saw their consequences, and he saw whose glory he had truly been serving. As the pattern took shape for him, so did a sound. He heard the anthem, and he heard its music. There was a melody there, and he was part of it. Surrender flooded his system, and the triumphant shape of Typhus filled his dying vision. Corvus's jaw snapped open, his throat contorted with ecstatic agony, and he became one with Legata's final choir. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this. Another video tomorrow. Not too sure what it'll be. But like I say, there'll be one. Hopefully, pretty much, I'm nearly like 99% sure, uh, sure every day of the December. So, yeah, hope you enjoy that. Please do remember to like the video. Uh, let me know down below anything you liked, anything you didn't like. That all helps. And also subscribe if you're not subscribed. If you just managed to find this by accident to stay up to date with what's coming out next. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. Really appreciate it, lads. It means a lot. And to all the recent people who have joined, fantastic. Thank you. It's great. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I'll be back again with for more soon. See you later. Have a good one. Bye-bye.